Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 123. Today's questions are taken from guide 187 on the battle class destroyers and the special on naval guns 1650 to 1820. Iten Rosen asks, what were the strengths and weaknesses between the gearings and the battle class? How did the two classes roles in their respective navies differ? The gearings were fractionally heavier than the battles, but not by all that much. They were very, very fractionally longer, but overall dimensionally and displacement-wise, there's not a lot in it. When it came to armament, the gearings flat out had more. They had more main guns because if they had six twin mounts, the battles only had two. The gearings had more anti-aircraft guns. They had roughly the same number of 40 millimeters as a... Uh, battle did but they had a bunch of extra orlicans and as long as you weren't talking about the gearing variants that lost their second torpedo launcher they also had a couple of extra torpedoes aboard uh, as they had two quintuple launchers as opposed to two quads on the battles however there were qualitative differences between the mountings and in the case of the main arm the gun types so the the four and a half inch gun which was on the battles actually had a slightly longer anti-aircraft range and a slightly longer anti-surface range than the 5 inch 38 did. Um, it's not a huge amount but it, it is there and that has probably more of an effect on post-war use than anything else. Then with regards to the, the Bofors mounts the battles whether they were using Hazemeyer or both or stags they were using stabilized mounts whereas as far as i can tell the mark ii quad 40 millimeter bofors which was the one of the more common th mounts you'd find on the gearings wasn't stabilized the fire control systems were but not the gun mountings themselves and this very likely explains the difference in the quantity of light and medium anti-aircraft weapons on a gearing compared to on a battle because the stabilized mountings are heavier than unstabilized mountings therefore you can fit fewer of them so the gearing could output more shells in a given amount of time but the battle could probably put out more accurate fire in that amount of time because of the the stabilized nature of all of its gun mountings when it came to post-war uses the gearings actually had a relatively long career uh, although a large number of them were converted from their world war ii use effectively as anti-aircraft destroyers to be fair largely because of the absence of most of the japanese surface units through having already been sunk but that, that was basically their their main aim the anti-aircraft warfare during the the last part of the second world war whilst the battles were also geared around that mission profile to a large extent uh, towards the end of world war ii the gearings later careers would see them mostly converted towards anti-submarine warfare um, there were other conversions to other operations but the majority of the the gearing conversions were focused around asw whereas with the battles well a lot of them didn't um, have particularly long careers partly due to budget cuts in the rn partly because they were superseded relatively quickly by the darings which in a lot of ways were innovations or build outs on the battle design and the darings in some ways more closely resemble the gearings especially with the uh, four twin mounts two four one aft now the few battles that did survive both in the royal navy and the royal australian navy their roles tended to stay more surface and anti-air oriented they did receive some anti-submarine upgrades but not quite the same level of almost complete switch around of emphasis that a lot of the gearings did so yeah that they had broadly similar roles during world war ii but slightly different approaches to that role um, and then diverged quite significantly after the second world war 
Rohan Benedict Hahn asks, what are the differences between the twin stag 40mm bofors and the twin Hazemeyer 40mm bofors? They're effectively two main differences. The Hazemeyer requires two separate crews, one to actually load, aim, fire and operate the gun, and another to stabilise the weapon. But uh, as far as it goes, it is just a stabilised gun mount, whereas with the Stag, at least as far as any of the references I can find, it requires just a single crew um, to load, aim and fire the gun. The stabilisation is done automatically. And on top of that, it also has its own fire control system and radar on the mount, as opposed to the Hazemeyer, which is literally just the gun on the mount, and any fire control direction comes from an external source. Now, it might seem fairly obvious that the Stag mount would be considered superior, and indeed that was the idea that was supposed to replace the Hazemeyer mount. Stag, by the way, is S-T-A-A-G, stands for uh, Stabilised Tachymetric Anti-Aircraft Gun. But as it turned out, while both, both systems were fairly complex, the initial offerings of the Stag mount were too complex and tended to break down very, very easily, requiring an awful lot of maintenance. Now, there were also some issues initially with placing the fire control radar a bit too far forward and the vibration of the guns firing actually disabling it. Shades of Bismarck there, but um, by moving that slightly further back on the mounting, that issue was solved. So generally speaking, the Stag was a better self-contained, self-operating mount as long as it worked. It was just a question of, would it actually work? Um, and because of all of this extra automation and the fire control and radar stuck in, the Stag mount also weighed an awful lot more than the Hazemeyer, which in turn weighed more than a standard unstabilized mounting. And so the whilst the, the Stag appeared to offer certain advantages, it did limit the number of installations you could actually have. You could have more Hazemeyer mounts for a given amount of displacement than you could Stag mounts. And uh, yeah, it, it turned out that basically having the, the second gun crew to or the second crew to stabilise the Hazemeyer actually weighed less, even though you had more men aboard. Um, but there were trade-offs, because obviously it's not just an issue when you've got men aboard of weight. You've also got to accommodate and feed them. So there, there potentially is an argument to say that the Stag overall saved weight across the ship, but that would have to be examined with a lot of the, sort of, say, the pluses and minuses of accommodation space feeding versus... Um, the additional point weight of the stag. Progressively improved versions of the stag did come out, but ultimately they were superseded by short-ranged anti-aircraft missiles, so uh, that was kind of the end of the race. UNSC Forward Onto Dawn asks, given your criticism of the Bismarck class, do you think the Germans would have been better off building two additional Scharnhorst class and fitting them with the 15-inch turrets and possibly retrofitting the last two as well? This is a question that comes up uh, semi-regularly, so I'll be fairly brief with this particular response. But yes, I think they probably would have been better off. And that's ma mainly for one reason. What, by the time Bismarck and later Tirpitz entered into service, the industrial might of Britain, and by the time Tirpitz was in service, the USA as well, was in was more fully into play. The lethality of air power had increased quite significantly um, compared to 1939. Every year, air power lethality against surface ships went up quite a considerable amount, both land and carrier based. And so by the time you got to the Bismarcks actually coming into service, well, we all know how Bismarck and Tirpitz's careers actually ended, but they didn't end up managing to accomplish a dramatic amount. Uh, whereas if you look at Scharnhorst and her sister ship's activities in the early part of the war, they actually accomplished significantly more in the first couple of years of the war than the Bismarcks ever did. And in some large part, that was down to the fact that in that early part of the war, the Royal Navy didn't have... King George V's in service, so they didn't have modern fast battleships, so really the, 
only things that the Shan horse could be run down by would be Hood, Renown, and Repulse. And whilst the Shan horse with 11-inch guns couldn't reliably take on the older 15-inch ships, the older 15-inch ships, the QEs and the R's, and obviously Nelson and Rodney as well, they couldn't chase them down. Now combine that with the relative lack of lethality of air power in the early part of the war and the fact that the sort of the industrial might of the Allied forces hadn't quite fully swung into action and the operating environment for surface capital ships of the Kriegsmarine in 1939, 1940, maybe up into early 1941 is considerably more favourable than it would be from sort of um, early to mid-1941 onwards. The Bismarcks come in in that latter period. The Shan Horse are already operational in the former period, and Shan Horse class are slightly faster to build. Now, granted, some of the build time for the Bismarcks, especially Tirpitz, is down to wartime delays, but even so, the Shan Horse have roughly a three-year build to commission time, which means that if you lay down two Shan Horses instead of two Bismarcks in mid to late 1936, you'd probably be looking at commissioning them in mid to late 1939 before the wartime restrictions come into place which okay fair enough commissioning the ship is not this, quite the same as it being fully ready for service but you'd probably have at least one maybe both in service by the end of 1939 and almost certainly have both in service by the time of the Norwegian campaign and well given the impact that the Shan Horsts had on the Norwegian campaign the impact of double the number of capital ships and with those at least those two being significantly more lethal that i mean if the germans still won the norwegian campaign but they could have had a lot more effect on the royal navy as a result because you've got say the action of lofoten island where um renown it chases off the two shan horses if Renown had run into two 15-inch armed Shan horse. I'm not sure that outcome would have been anywhere like similar. And likewise, when the two Shan horse historically go off on various commerce raiding missions and then eventually end up in Brest, um, they, if you either accompany them or as well as send out these 15-inch armed ships, then those 15-inch armed ships are possibly going to be able to even with the restrictive orders that the uh, German High Command give them, go after the older battleships in the convoy escorts. I'm on paper, two 15-inch armed Shan horse should definitely be able to go after it. The only reason I say possibly is because, as I say, the Greeks when High Command was a little bit sketchy about sending the ships out and telling them that they could engage enemy capital ship forces. So whilst overall it wouldn't have changed the course of the war... I certainly think if the Germans had fast-tracked a couple of 15-inch Shan horse instead of the Bismarcks, they probably would have gotten an awful lot more use out of them before inevitably sort of mid-41-ish the increasing Allied sea and air power bottles them into either German or Norwegian ports. Winter Vulpine asks, what do you think about the Royal Navy separating the duties of its smaller destroyer-sized ships? somewhat similar to the modern day where frigates tend to be anti-submarine and destroyers anti-air could this have helped the royal navy during world war ii as they could then focus on building or deploying specialized ships to deal with threats in certain areas instead of having all their ships capable of doing every job if at somewhat compromised efficiency in a scenario where the royal navy is free to build however much it wants from um and however many numbers it wants this would be a better approach however at the time that the Royal Navy is built, building most of its ships in the pre-war period, it is limited to a certain extent by a mixture of budget and treaty, depending on which particular classes of ships you're looking at. And the Royal Navy was always acutely aware it never had enough destroyers. They also pretty much knew they didn't have enough cruisers. Pretty much the only thing they actually had, quote-unquote, enough of, as in we've hit the treaty limits on, was uh, capital ships but the royal navy was quite aware that a fleet destroyer was not an ideal anti-submarine warfare platform and not an ideal anti-submarine 
platform for convoy escort but the thing was that with the amount of money they had available if they had split designs into going right we're going to build an anti-submarine warfare destroyer or frigate and we're going to build a separate large fleet destroyer with anti-aircraft capability then they would have ended up with not enough of either so with the whilst having general purpose destroyers did mean to a certain extent that they they weren't absolute top end at any one particular thing unless they actually did go for heavy specialization like the tribals it did mean that if there was a sudden need for destroyers in a particular field you at least had the holes to consider filling that need so if you're suddenly faced with having to deploy lots of individual uh flotillas or fleets or squadrons or whatever you want to call it you can provide a destroyer screen to all of them because you have these many dozens of fleet destroyers whereas if you say split the build 50 50 between anti-submarine and anti-surface dash anti-air destroyers then that would have actually probably limited the royal navy's ability to deploy forces and fleets all over the place so in because obviously you think you've got the home fleet that needs destroyer escorts you've got destroyers based around the south coast you've got force h you've got the mediterranean fleet and so on and so forth and if you're suddenly faced with we physically do not have enough fleet destroyers to provide all of these fleets or forces with their screens you now can't cover certain commitments and whilst out on the convoys you have some dedicated anti-submarine warfare ships again you're going to be limited in the number because you, you just don't have enough once world war ii gets going and they're free to build as many ships as they can afford then you start to see the mass production of pretty much dedicated anti-submarine warfare sloops and corvettes and frigates and such like and you see more and more um fleet destroyers kind of like the battles heading out there although even with fleet destroyers like the battles and the darings they still obviously retain an anti-submarine warfare capability because these are the ships that are going to be heading out with the fleet itself and these are the ships that therefore will be providing the anti-submarine screen so in the second world war you period you definitely do need the all-purpose destroyer if there was one thing that could have dramatically improved the effectiveness of royal navy destroyers in the run-up to world war ii it would have been if they'd been able to resolve the issues with the design and manufacture of the 4.5 inch dual purpose gun a bit quicker than they did for destroyer use obviously they were able to put it in on carriers and uh the refit queen elizabeth and renown uh somewhat earlier but if they'd been able to get that gun into mass production in a suitable destroyer mounting as well then you could have seen everything from the tribals onwards potentially with these dual purpose 4.5 inch weapons which were much superior in the aa role to the 4.7 inch and if that then spread across the entire uh fleet so k class obviously the tribals the all the wartime destroyer builds then there would have been considerably more anti-aircraft capability within the fleet which of course means less ships lost to aircraft which in turn means you have a larger fleet going on personally and admittedly this is somewhat retrospective but personally if it was up to me i would have concentrated the resources from the 5.25 inch program into the 4.5 inch program and just gone with 10 twin 5.25 similar to the qe's and the renowns on the king george v's quite where that would have left the dido class is somewhat open to interpretation but a couple of them got by with four and a half inch guns without too much problem um and that if you had this single mass manufacturing effort that might even have allowed you to put all 10 uh guns on the dido's even if they are 4.5s or maybe with the lesser weight of the 4.5s versus the 5.25s you might have been able to get an atlanta style uh well maybe not necessarily a full atlanta style with the wing turrets but at least an atlanta style three twins forward three twins aft on the dido's but who knows sir garland tyrell asks what ranges are we talking about for different types and eras of guns i.e what constitutes short range so broadly speaking at least up to the 
period that this channel covers up to about 1950, you can divide the eras of gun ranging into about three, although the last one needs a little bit more subdivision. So those eras would be the the era of the cannon, if you like, then the era of approximately speaking the ironclad, um, although depending on the nation and the gun in question that might extend a little bit before or indeed actually start a little bit after 1860, depending on specific circumstances. And then you get into the 20th century almost almost exactly. So in the what you might call the age of sail, the era of the cannon, short range was you can probably shoot at them with small arms, pistols and muskets as well. Medium range was a little bit beyond that, but probably not much further than a few hundred yards. Um, bearing in mind that although you can technically reach out a few hundred yards with a musket, um, if you're trying to do that on a ship, good luck. Um, and then long range would be either largely speculative fire um, if you're in a ship-to-ship -ship action or perhaps more more prosaically done from long from uh, fortifications the majority of the reasoning for this was a combination of the fact that guns had a certain amount of inherent lag between when you lit the uh, the trail of powder or whatever fusing system you were using and the gun actually going off and the ship was moving and as we've seen in the uh, fire control and ranging video the ship moving is a fairly major factor um, especially if you're on what other at the time rel compared to now relatively speaking small wooden vessels so you can say yes well we wish to fire at that ship well yeah but your gun's actually going to fire anything from half a second to uh, over a second after you try and actually ignite it and during that time with your ship pitching and rolling anything much beyond several hundred yards and the chances of you your gun pointing in any, anything like the right direction vertically are pretty much slim to none um, this is why shore fortification has a slightly longer range because the shore fortifications generally speaking don't move um, so it's then you, the limiting factor is the time of the fuse and the human eye's ability to estimate range and deflection which factor into the ships as well um, so overall on a ship basis at least gun ranges would rarely exceed the upper hundreds of yards um, anything much beyond that was usually a product of luck once you get into the roughly speaking ironclad era you now have guns that can be set off near enough instantaneously when you actually want to. Um, the development of things like uh, flintlock mechanisms for firing cannons in the latter stages of the Age of Sail, this is why I said it kind of extends a little bit into the Age of Sail, um, but with things like percussion caps and, and such, you, you get a, even closer to pretty much instantaneous firing. That to a certain degree eliminates the roll from your calculations not entirely because you still have the vertical motion of the ship to account for but at least the ship when you fire the gun is going to be roughly pointing in the direction you think it should be um, in terms of roll the you're still aiming by the human eye and um, there's not really any other major kind of stabilization mechanisms but overall effective gun range has extended a little bit but when you look at things like the Battle of Lissa the various battles of the Spanish-American War you can see that um, there's there's still limitations but still based somewhat on roll with a vertical motion affecting the shell's flight and you're now reaching the extent of the human eye uh, in its capability to aim and so whilst ranges have crept up by maybe a few hundred yards so you're now talking about a comfortable engagement range sitting at probably five to eight hundred yards rather than three to five hundred it's not gone up 
all that much. Um, you can still get in, end up in circumstances where you're effectively doing an old school broadside engagement at point blank range. Um, but point blank range is now probably a ship's length away rather than literally muzzle to muzzle and boarding actions all all <laughs> for everybody. Um, then you get into the 20th century and with the development of rangefinders and fire control systems, then suddenly effective ranges jump dramatically. So you have, let's say, the Spanish-American War at the turn of the century where whilst the gun ranges are a little bit longer than the age of sail, they wouldn't be completely out of order for an age of sail engagement. And then by the time of the Russo-Japanese War, you've got into the high thousands of yards. By the time of the start of World War One, you've got into the mid to high tens of thousands of yards. And by the time you get to the Second World War, you're talking about engagements for any significant size ship, i.e. cruisers and upwards, starting at over 20,000 yards. And in some cases of some people with very ambitious or very um, accurate rangefinders, even engagements starting at over 30,000 yards, even though no one actually scored a direct hit at over that range. And this, of course, is mainly looking at the larger types of gun. But to be perfectly honest, because of the limitations not being necessarily the gun and more the human factors and the ship itself, the exact type of gun doesn't really make all that much odds until you get into the 20th century because almost every gun could be shot out to about 700,000, 1,200 yards quite easily, um, whether that be a, a dinky little um, 3-inch gun or a 16.25-inch monster or everything in between. About the only thing that couldn't quite effectively reach out that far with aimed fire would be some of the very early machine guns that were mounted on some of the later ironclads. AVG J03 asks, uh, you mentioned accurate gunnery in the duel between HMS Shannon and USS Ches Chesapeake. I've read that Captain Broke was an early proponent of accurate gunnery with groups of guns focusing and coordinating fire on specific parts of the enemy's ship. If I remember correctly, this included adding rudimentary sights to the guns and painting firing angles on the decks under the carriages. I've also heard that an extra long commission with the same crew gave Captain Broke lots of time to train his gun crews to an unusual degree. By comparison, Captain Lawrence had recently taken command of the Chesapeake and was fitting her out and crewing her just before the fight, highlighting the importance of crew training. Unfortunately, in addition to non-fiction texts, some of my sources are fictional, um, but how much of this is true? Was Captain Broke the progenitor of the gunnery officer, or was, he, uh, was accurate gunnery a common goal for naval officers in this time period? There was a lot more variation in what naval officers tended to go for in the Age of Sail as compared to later on, especially in the 20th century, where things were a lot more regimented and training was standardised. Um, for example, um, some of the poor gunnery discipline on the HMS Macedonian was cited during the court-martial of its captain uh, following its loss in the War of 1812. Um, when it was thought that Macedonian should have done a lot better than it did. So you could have circumstances where a crew had been on the same ship under the same captain for potentially years and still wasn't all that good at gunnery. You could have circumstances where a ship was brand new and the captain and crew had only been together for a few months and they might be far superior at gunnery to the longer service vessel based largely on the personal predilections of the captain in question uh, because you've got to in the age of sail you've got to divide it up into gunnery up into two rough categories you've got good gunnery could consist of accurate fire which as actually was somewhat covered in the previous question has certain limitations to it unless you were at very close range, and rate of fire, which was actually very important because a lot of fights tended to happen at close range where it was somewhat more difficult to miss the ship generally, and this was one of the key advantages that the Royal Navy had in a lot of the engagements in the Napoleonic Wars was the fact that they could simply fire far quicker than their French and Spanish opponents, so if you're just blazing away at each other at pistol shot range, well, the side that's putting three times as much metal into you as you are into them is probably going to kill a lot more of your 
crew and therefore force your surrender a lot faster than vice versa um but even but even within that kind of close range engagement there was a place for accurate gunnery and whilst a fair number of the royal navy for obvious reasons and quite easily historically proven did look at um rapid fire and they were able to fire very quickly as a result only certain officers would really go deep into the accuracy of gunnery and yeah to be fair captain broke definitely was one of them um now there e even so that there is a certain amount of not quite random but general fire that you want to give in an age of sail fight because pretty much the entire length of the enemy ship is a gun deck so um you, anywhere you fire along there as long as you hit vaguely in that area you're you're going to be in the vicinity of doing some kind of damage that is important to the continuation of the fight whether that be taking out the guns themselves um or disabling or killing the the gun crews uh, but there were specific targets on a ship that could help bring it bring a, an enemy ship to heel a lot sooner such as the masts or the steering position or particular command crew and we see this actually in at Trafalgar where the Redoutable which ends up fighting HMS Victory whilst the captain hasn't managed to train had the time or the sea space to train his actual main gunners in rapid or accurate fire he has taken the opportunity to train another kind of gunner his sharpshooters in rapid aimed fire and that's what eventually brings down Nelson in the Chesapeake versus Shannon engagement Broke had actually made it seems to have made a specific point not just of training his gunners in general to be very good at their jobs but also in picking some of the best he had on the ship um, and if I remember correctly they were using a nine pounder on the upper decks of the ship and this particular gun and crew were believe it or not if you can uh, imagine it basically using a ship's cannon as a gigantic sniper rifle to pick off individual crew on the Chesapeake. Chesapeake went through, I think, four or five helmsmen um, because this particular gun was tasked with and succeeded in just picking them off one after the other and eventually smashing the ship's wheel as well, which, for obvious reasons, made controlling the Chesapeake something of a difficult prospect. You could obviously steer by tiller in a backup position, but you had nowhere near the same level of um, immediate control and response that you would um, with a trained helmsman at the wheel. But as far as Chesapeake's crewmen um, went, it's, I think, perhaps overdoing a bit to say, oh, they were completely green. Um, the crew as a whole, yes, was new, but a significant portion of Chesapeake's crew were previous frigate crew. Um, indeed, a good chunk of them had been around for Chesapeake's previous voyage. So they weren't all like brand new seamen. They were a fairly, fairly large core of experienced gunners, as a lot of them from actually from having been on the ship previously, with a leavening of fresh sailors, um, perhaps somewhat less experienced, who were, were brought in to complete the ship's crew as it sailed out. And they gave a fairly good accounting of themselves, to be fair. I mean, you look at the uh, Captain uh, Broke's report, obviously he got quite badly injured um, in the event, um, but you look at the, the Shannon's report and Captain Broke's notes, Chesapeake was not doing half bad in terms of the amount, the rapidity of gunnery and the consistency of gunnery that it was delivering. Um, it's just that, well, Captain Broke had a plan and it turned out to be a possibly a better plan at least a definitely a better executed plan um so yeah i i think it does to say the chesapeake was inexperienced is definitely false as far as its crew goes and to say that they just lost because their green doesn't bear up under the weight of the evidence of the actual engagement itself and really does a bit of a disservice to uh captain lawrence and the chesapeake's crew they were pretty good it's just that Shannon and Captain Broke were just flat out better in that particular circumstance. And th this is the thing I think we have to bear in mind across a lot of different naval engagements. Yes, there are cases where captains and crews are flat out awful or subpar. But there are also a fair number of engagements where 
both sides are actually very good and it's just either through human factors or occasionally technological factors one side wins because they're just a bit better but that doesn't mean the other side is awful um you could point to uh, say the battle of the falkland islands no one is going to accuse von spey and his crews of being bad it's just that between having battle cruisers um which to be fair is fairly helpful um as well as obviously well-trained royal navy gunners that combination for admiral sturdy was just a bit better than von spey's and nathan d asks you mentioned that trunnions used to be lower on the gun but were later moved to the gun center line decreasing the strain on gun carriages and how often the gun would fly off its carriage was there some advantage to mounting trunnions lower on the gun or was the earlier design with the trunnions lower on the barrel simply a flawed design from what i've read um the trunnions on the lower part of cannons as you can kind of see here was sort of an evolution out of the fact that originally cannons didn't have them at all um you look at a lot of medieval cannons they're effectively just tubes if somewhat decorated tubes sitting in long boxes and if you wanted to move them then well you could try and pick the whole thing up but that would be very complicated and the box might fail um so and usually the boxes were somewhat temporary arrangements anyway so you would stick effectively logs beams whatever you bars etc under the gun pick it up and walk off with it stick it on a cart hopefully and when they introduced actual gun carriages well the the, the trunnions were there to obviously link the gun to the carriage and also to allow you to pivot and aim the gun which is why they are roughly around the center of mass um but previously you, you'd had these sort of whatever beams or lifting devices underneath the gun and it, they also served to help you lift and move the gun if the carriage broke or was damaged in some way and so they were initially kind of just cast in the as close to the same position as the these previous bars that were stuck underneath the gun had been which was lower down on the gun um it also had certain advantages um initially especially for land-based guns when it came to accessing the guns obviously the gun sits slightly higher um, on the carriage so you can adjust the aim a bit more without having to make the carriage excessively tall which saves weight improves stability all this kind of thing um but it does mean that even obviously with a barrel down the center of the gun that when you fire the gun the there is now a turning moment exerting itself on the trunnions within the structure of the gun which means that if you don't have the gun restrained it will not only fly backwards it will also tend to fly upwards if it's pivoting around that point um and obviously the the, the strain because of the turning moment is is somewhat greater on the gun carriage as well by dropping the trunnions or raising them i guess up to the middle of the gun so in line with the line of fire it's then near enough purely a horizontal mo moment of force from or movement from the recoil of the gun heading back into the trunnions then being exerted on the carriage uh, and so the strain is less the chance of the gun flying up and off is less uh, it does mean however that the gun sits lower in the carriage um which on ships is an advantage because it lowers the overall height that you need for the for the gun um but it also means that the carriage itself generally is more of a permanent fixture for the gun because it's going to be slightly harder to extract the gun from a damaged carriage but on naval ships where the guns would just sit there on the gun decks rather than being hauled around europe um to fire at various castles and such that wasn't so much of a concern except for post-battle damage repairs. Then we have, what is your opinion of the way Admiral Calder was treated after the Battle of Cape Finisterre? Is he the 19th century version of Admiral Jellicoe in that regard, i.e. unfair criticism after a good performance? So, for those of you who don't know, the Battle of Cape Finisterre was one of the battles that Admiral Villeneuve led the uh, French fleet into in what is loosely termed the run-up to the Trafalgar Battle. Um, obviously the English fleet at this point under Admiral Calder it was outnumbered and it fought the French in rather foggy low visibility conditions 
And uh, see, the Battle of Cape Finisterre itself, there is nothing to Fort Calder for, um, really. Obviously, there's always a few minor things you can point to, but you can do that in practically every battle. The actual battle was fought pretty well. The British fleet was quite badly outnumbered, but they still came out of it with far fewer casualties and a couple of prizes. So that was all good um, against the Franco-Spanish force. Um, the most hilarious thing actually about that battle, and at some point I must do a video on the Battle of Cape Finister, is that the rearmost British ship, HMS Malta, ends up alone in the fog, surrounded by five enemy ships, and decides, well, I'm in a target-rich environment, I shall shoot at everything, and gets away with it. Not only does it get away with it, it fights its way out of five enemy ships, and then proceeds to capture two of them, um, which you know, are the only two captures of the battle. So the ship that probably had the single worst chance is the one that comes out with the most prize money, which I'm not sure which of the two it is, whether it's an absolutely terrible indictment on Villeneuve's leadership of the Franco-Spanish fleet or whether it's just a massive, massive kudos to the captain of HMS Malta who decided to fight practically everybody, um, probably a bit of both. But, um, yeah, that that part, no problem. The reason Calder got court-martialed afterwards was the action broke off for the night, fair enough, everyone understood that, but he was then in contact with the Franco-Spanish fleet for the next couple of days and refused to re-engage. His justification was that the Malta, somewhat understandably, was quite badly damaged. Uh, another ship, HMS Windsor Castle, was also somewhat damaged, and he wanted to also protect the two prizes he'd taken. And his basic argument was, well, I'm still fairly outnumbered, so um, I, I'm just going to keep in contact with them and then eventually they'll go away. That's the bit he got court martial for, for refusing to re-engage the enemy. And on that count, whilst being outnumbered with some damaged ships and prizes to protect sounds like a fairly rational thing on the face of it, it just it wasn't in the spirit of the Royal Navy at the time, and I kind of agree to a certain degree extent with the justifications for taking him to the court martial because he had just had proof the day before that his fleet could take on the Franco Spanish fleet and come out at on top. Um, and yes, okay, Malta and um. And Malta and the, the other ship, uh, Windsor Castle, are both damaged. However, the Franco-Spanish fleet also has a bunch of ships that are damaged, and they've lost two. You know they've lost two, because you have them. Um, okay, you're not going to use them in battle, but you're down partially two ships, they're down fully two ships, and then everyone else is kind of, yeah, battle damage, etc., Given those circumstances, he probably should have re-engaged. Um, and the fact that he didn't, yeah, given that he's operating in an era where you're, you've got people like Earl St. Vincent and Nelson floating around, yeah, he was going to get called to the carpet for that. Wienve asks, The Austro-Hungarian Empire was famously multilingual. How was this problem dealt with in their navy during the last decades of its existence, and how good or bad were the relationships between the different language groups in the navy before World War I? Uh, for example, were sailors still mostly drafted from the Mediterranean provinces, speaking mainly Italian or Serbo-Croatian? Were they divided up by languages, with some ships being German-speaking, some Italian? Or were they divided internally, with, say, German speakers being engineers, and Italian speakers being seamen, and so forth and so on? So by the late 19th century and early 20th century, and believe me, I had to go fairly deep for this. Eventually I found most of the answers in a book called uh, The Naval Policy of Austria-Hungary, 1867 to 1918, uh, which was actually very enlightening. But anyway, um, back at the beginning of the 19th century, the then Austrian Navy actually mostly used Italian, um, of all things, later transitioning over to mostly German as the official language of command, but everyone was kind of recruited from all over the empire, and as the as it became Austria-Hungary, the Hungarians obviously started asking for a little bit more emphasis on their own language being put in place. So 
for example, during the time of uh, the, the late 1800s, when you went to the Naval Academy to become an officer, you had to be taught, if you didn't already know at least one of these languages, but you, they made sure that you were fluent in Italian, Serbo-Croatian, English, and French, although later that was extended to being English or French, uh, plus, of course, German, and um, by the, the latter part of the 1880s and 1890s, the Hungarians had also managed to wedge Hungarian into their... Um, with a few exceptions um, for people who had absolutely no idea how to speak the very unique language that is Hungarian. Um, so that's just the officers. But in terms of the linguistic groups of the sailors themselves, there was a fairly high amount of recruits from the coastal areas for hopefully some obvious reasons. Um, and there does appear to have been some linguistic division. So um, the, the seamen and the stokers generally tended to speak one language. The gunners tended to speak another language. Um, the engine. The annoying thing is the engineering officers spoke different. Generally spoke a different language to the stokers. Um, and sort of the higher echelons, the people who tend to work on the superstructure, would speak yet another language. And then technically everyone was supposed to understand German commands, but. That usually didn't happen, which is why everyone who was an officer had to speak so many different languages, got in the vague hope that someone somewhere would understand what on earth they were on about. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a little bit of a mess. I think the Austro-Hungarian Empire at one point had something like 14 different official languages. So there was always going to be a risk of someone not understanding something or there being problems passing down orders in good time, etc., etc. So, yeah... Um, it was a problem that they'd made a fairly good effort at solving, but it was never entirely solved down on the fine detail level, um, right up until, obviously, the Austro-Hungarian Empire ceased to be. Nickboy302 asks, You mentioned previously that gun turrets mainly relied on hydraulic systems to move and operate. Could you describe those systems in brief, such as 8-inch uh, guns on HMS Australia? Well, very briefly, the reason hydraulic systems were used was because you needed something that could move immense amounts of weight around, but was also going to be able to do that at relatively low speeds. I mean, obviously you want your gun turrets to turn relatively swiftly, but when you're talking about the stubborn thing that weighs hundreds or even thousands of tons, you're physically not going to get it moving that fast and you don't want it moving too quickly because, well, once you get it started, you have to stop it. So this was why you used hydraulic drives. Some nations, especially the French, actually had a fair amount of success with geared electric drives, um, but most people used uh, hydraulic systems or electro-hydraulic systems for ma the majority of the battleship period. HMS Invincible, interesting enough, did try to have electrically driven turrets and mainly looked like a gigantic Tesla coil until sanity prevailed. Um, now, the, the, the way it would work would be, obviously, you'd have a pump, and whether that was powered by steam, a generator, or electricity, or whatever, doesn't make much odds, that pump would pump the hydraulic fluid around and the hydraulic fluid would run the hydraulic motor, and the hydraulic motor, usually the whole thing was um, attached to the turret itself, and this is important, because it would then have a pinion, tooth pinion, and there would usually be a fixed tooth rack that was actually part of the structure of the ship. And so the, the pinion that was driven by the hydraulic uh, motor would move against the rack and so the turret would be pushed around on its bearings um in some ways kind of like a funicular railway does um except obviously going around in a circle instead of up a mountain that's the the very very basic way that you move um a, hy a hydraulically operated turret around now when you're talking about the rest of the turret operations, every a lot of almost everything is hydro <laughs> hydraulic because massive amounts of force um, in well, relatively speaking, a relatively safe way of doing things. So the the rams to load the guns were hydraulic arms, and the way of elevating and lowering the guns themselves inside the turret was also done with with hydraulic rams. Um, 
they're a little bit more prosaic. It's a fairly simple hydraulic ram system. Um, they did try using compressed air at one point for the gun rams, but it, it didn't really work out very well. So Long John asks, what is the longest ranged hit ever scored by a cruiser? I remember reading somewhere that um, there were hits the Admiral Hipper scored on HMS Akate, but I'm not familiar with any others in the running. So the most likely candidates in this particular category, weirdly enough, are all either Japanese or Italian. But um, of those, so you've got the uh, the Battle of Komodorsky Islands, you've got um, the Maya and uh, another Japanese ship engaging the Salt Lake City with possible hits scored around the 22,000 yard bracket. Um, so that's one for the Japanese. There's another for the Japanese, which is during the Battle of the Java Sea, when um, Haguro and Nachi are both engaging the Exeter. The, now, one of them hit Exeter. The problem is which one. Um, also, as is very typical with a lot of the Japanese engagements, different sources have completely different ideas of what the range is. So... Um, some sources cite 20,000 yards, some say 23,000 yards, some say one says 26,000 yards, one says 27,000 yards. So it's like, well, if it's 27,000 yards, that'd be the longest range hit, period. Um, even more than War Spite and uh, Scharnhorst. But, um, yeah, it's, it, it seems somewhat less likely. Um, some of the lower figures probably more likely considering those are the kind of ranges the Japanese were actually historically known to be engaging in in all the other battles. But with both Japanese figures there is some disagreement. Komodorsky Islands, the range figures plus or minus a little bit. Battle of the Java Sea is like 20,000 and something yards. It's so... I. I wouldn't necessarily write it off entirely, but I would kind of say, well, but there's no real easy way to tell with the information we have available to us at the moment. Um, however, what we do know is probably the longest ranged one was um, during the Battle of Cape Spartivento. So we know there was a hit because Beric, the uh, the punching bag of the county class, took a hit on White Turret, and both both of the guns in White Turret were knocked out. So we know that that was very definitely a hit. It wasn't a near miss. It wasn't a splinter or anything like that. So definitely, definitely a hit. Um, and both sides, which include multiple ships, do agree that the range is around about, give or take, 24,000 yards. Um... Well, they agree that that's the range about two minutes before an ancient shell hits and no cruisers travelling at several thousand yards in a couple of minutes. So, and accounting for flight time, there's no way a cruiser is transiting through several thousand yards in a minute or so. Um, so, because there is that, like, that two minute time difference, we don't know exactly what the range was either at the time of the shell being fired or at the time of hitting, but it was oh, somewhere around 24,000 yards um, so yeah poor old Beric yeah, keeps getting beaten up but there you go Timo Fiebig asks we know that night fighting was very hard to do before the advent of radar but that the Japanese in World War II heavily trained to do night fighting were there other navies previously in the Age of Sail or earlier that also trained for night fighting, or was night fighting something exclusive to the Age of Steam and Steel? So I'm not aware of any navy in, as a sort of as a general rule, that practiced for fighting at night in the pre-steam era. Although, if anyone does know, it'd probably be some obscure navy in antiquity. So please do let me know if I'm wrong. Um, but it's kind of there's a two part question there is did anyone specifically train for fighting at night as a deliberate tactic not that I, I say not that I'm aware of but was night fighting at night the province purely of the age of steam and steel no definitely not there were quite a number of accepted tactics for fighting at night um which were kind of called up on a situational basis big battles they 
tended to try and avoid at night because of the sheer amount of confusion that was possible. But um, as you can see here, fire ship attacks at night were very popular. Um, there were also cutting out operations, which is when boats would try and sneak in, usually with muffled oars, uh, to try and swarm up, overwhelm and cut the cables, hence cutting out of uh, an enemy ship to seize it and capture it and take it away. Um, and there were some uh, actual nighttime engagements between ships at various points, usually due to circumstance. So, for example, um, actually the capture of USS President, for example, was a combat that went on into the into the hours of darkness. So there there were definitely infrequent, but relatively well known actions during the night, and there were certain tactics like cutting out fire ships that worked very well at night, but they they weren't the kind of the full focus or uh, specialist tactic of particular navies, as I, at least as I'm aware for those kinds of time periods. Silver Fox 575 asks, The viewing gallery on the side of an aircraft carrier's island is known as Vulture's Row. Where did this term come from? It appears to come from the fact that, well, in a lot of places when you see vultures, when they're not circling overhead, they tend to be all lined up in a nice neat row looking at something waiting for it to die, or at least show a sign of weakness. And as the viewing gallery since landing aircraft on carriers is usually a fairly interesting thing to watch you tend to attract a lot of visitors and of course one of the things that does happen quite often on well not very often but occasionally on aircraft carrier landings is something goes wrong and something gets damaged or even destroyed or aircraft go randomly off the side of the ship etc and of course that in creates a great deal of excitement in the viewing gallery because, amongst other things, the viewing gallery is usually populated by people who don't really have all that much to do with the aircraft landing on the deck, because if they were anything really to do with it, they'd probably be down there either piloting the aircraft or helping shepherd the aircraft off to its uh, parking spot. And so the, the sort of the connotation between this a uh, bunch of people looking for... Them, well, a bunch of... Um, predatory birds looking for something to keel over and die so that they can all feast and a bunch of people effectively kind of watching hoping something spectacular will happen so that they can see a crash you can see how people like oh yeah the, the vultures row just waiting for me to uh, to screw everything up mason asks i was reading about the battle of Peleliu recently and what struck me most was how nearly half a dozen battleships shelled the island which was even smaller than iwo jima for a week and yet the japanese defenses on the uma brogel mountain were essentially untouched granted the japanese did dig a deep tunnel network through the thick coral sides but considering how tiny the so-called mountain was i just find it unbelievable that that much firepower didn't just flatten it all together should the US Navy have shelled it for far longer, or is it a case that there's just only so much naval gunfire can do, even on tiny islands? It's a mixture of factors. Even though it's a small island, it's it's still an island. Um, so there is an awful lot of it relative to the blast radius of any given num reasonable number of battleship shells. And the Japanese at this particular battle were actually noted to be very very professional in not not retaliating with fire from their defenses whilst they're under the naval bombardment and so outside of the more obvious targets um it was actually very difficult to spot where japanese defenses might be and just plastering the side of a mountain in high explosive looks quite cool but unless you score a hit on or near a bunker or tunnel um even the explosive payload of a of a battleship's high explosive round the blast radius is considerable but not that considerable when you're talking about a hardened dug in dug in target like a bunker or tunnel um and as you can see uh from this photo although it's not strictly from the battle that this particular battle but a lot of the u.s bombardment sh um shells seem to have had problems with exploding um there's a famous picture somewhere of a whole 
cache of these that have been stacked up, sort of several dozen from from one small area. So obviously, if the shell doesn't explode, that doesn't help either. Uh, and of course, the particular geology of the of the area in question, the island in question, meant that as opposed to certain types of geology where the blast wave might propagate through and collapse walls and tunnels and so forth quite easily the the nature of most of the rock and coral and other stuff that made up this island was actually relatively good at absorbing blast waves so it meant you would have to hit relatively close to a target to have any kind of significant blast effect so basically it came down to to a small degree, some faulty shells, to but to a much, much larger degree, the fact that by staying heads down, the Japanese have made it very difficult to actually specifically target their defences, and they lucked out a little bit with some of the geology coming to their aid and damping out stuff that might otherwise have caused some damage to their defences. Um what, if anything, it showed, it was a need for better recon. Because quite how they do that, I don't know, maybe low-flying aircraft after a preliminary bombardment to suppress anti-aircraft guns and, and fight and uh, on island fighters, or or a closer in destroyer or something with a heavy-duty spotting uh, gear. But they really need to identify the actual Japanese defences as opposed to, we'll just blow up a good chunk of this mountainside and hope we get them. And now for some questions I apparently missed from last week. Um, Hagekaze asks, According to most sources I've seen, the only Japanese World War II carrier capable of operating the B-7A attack aircraft in the design role was Taiho. However, I can't find any reasoning for this. Doctrine, elevator, aircraft, takeoff speed, other fleet carrier speed, sizes, design requirements, etc. Everything seems to check out. Any ideas? So, as promised, I did a bit of digging for this one. There's some suggestion that there was an 11 meter limit on the length of Japanese naval aircraft that was dictated by the size of hangars and Taiho's ha um, not hangars uh, elevators and Taiho's elevators were larger and therefore could fit a longer aircraft and so this is why the the B7A could only be operated from Taiho. I don't really buy that. Um, largely on the grounds that. If there was an 11 meter rule in place, um, well, Shikaku had at least one elevator, the Shikaku and um, Hiryu, they had at least one elevator that could quite easily take an 11 meter long aircraft, especially considering the B7A, unlike some of its predecessors, could fold its wings. Um, now, okay, maybe granted Taiho would have an easier time operating B7A on that basis because it did have slightly larger elevators, this is true, but there's nothing strictly stopping you, as far as I can tell, from fitting a B7A on a Shikaku um, and its elevators. Now, Shikaku and Zwikaku, isn't it? Yes, not Hiryu. Sorry, ignore ignore the previous Hiryu. Um, anyway. The other suggestion I've seen is weight, and yeah, it was a heavier aircraft. It was considerably heavier than the B-5N, and um, the B-6 was heavier than the B-5N, but not as heavy as the B-7A. So I can, I can kind of see an argument of saying, well, maybe Taiho had a better arresting gear uh, that could take the, the weight of a B-7A coming into land, and maybe the other carriers didn't, but that's not really a limit on the cap on the ability to operate the aircraft because you can just upgrade the capacity of your arresting gear that's not that difficult um and it's a fairly powerful aircraft so on any other fleet carrier it should be okay to use um yeah now it is a bigger and heavier aircraft so it's, well, it, Ruggio didn't survive long enough, but if it had, I don't think you would have really gotten away with operating it off Ruggio. But certainly if something like Shikaku or Zuikaku, I can't see much problem in running a B7A off of them. It might have been slightly easier to operate them from a Taiho, but it, I don't, as far as I can see, 
I don't think there was any hard limit against operating them off some other carriers. Um, but uh, I shall have to consult Justin on this one in uh, even more detail and maybe bring you more details in a future dry dock. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, really, that's what it says, um, asked, suppose the Japanese revised 88 fleet, uh, the, so the Nagatos, Tosas, Keys, Amagis, and number 13 class, face off against the US Navy of June 1942. How would this scenario play out and who would win? Um, depends if they're coming in their 1920s variation or not. Assuming they're coming in a variant that's modified in June 42. Um, if they're facing off in a set piece engagement, they're going to win quite easily. Um, if you can put them in a box and force them to fight against each other, because, um, yeah, the, the Nagatos are in the same ballpark roughly as the Colorados and by June 42 um you've, you've maybe got North Carolina in there um uh, well North Carolina and Washington technically could probably bring them in um they still have a lot of operational issues though but Nagato is in the same ballpark as well anything that's not those um and superior, theoretically at least, to most. Um, there's still a Colorado or two kicking around because the salvage efforts are still going on. Um, and then you've got Tosa, Key, and Margi, number 13. They're all better than that um, and pretty much all more heavily armed, at least, than the uh, North Carolinas, especially the number 13s. So in a straight-up battleship engagement, especially June 42 after Pearl Harbor, the revised 8-8 fleet would have a significant advantage um, in kind of real life, if you like. They're, again, they're, they're actually quite quick, especially if they leave the, the Nagatos behind. Certainly the number 13s and the Amagis could run in very, very fast. But um, yeah, in real life, in June 42, the US Navy is in the Pacific is, main, is mainly basing itself around its carriers, at which point the carriers would just hightail it out of there and try and keep hitting them with aircraft, which would then come down to, well, which runs out of uh, health points and stamina first, the battleships or the air groups? Um, and, well, we, we, we tend to know how that plays out, but June 42, if they've all been refitted and they're operating together, it might be interesting, at least. And finally for today, Chris asks, Assume for a moment the British didn't succeed in acquiring the German naval codes early in World War I. What would or could have been the result of German efforts to draw out elements of the Grand Fleet in this case? Do you think the strategies employed by the Germans to draw out the Grand Fleet, such as at Dogger Bank, Jutland, bombardment of the English coast, etc., eventually would have succeeded in at least some piecemeal elimination of um, the British battle cruiser and battleship number advantage? So it's kind of a twofold thing. Just because the British, in this case, don't acquire the German codes doesn't mean they can't break the German ciphers. Uh, the Germans were changing their ciphers to an extent throughout the war, and whilst, yes, further code books were captured, the British were also cracking ciphers um, as they went. So there, there would have been some limited signals intelligence. So for any particular incident, I mean, it would have been a lot more up in the air as to how much intel the Royal Navy had but at any given time there's a chance they might still have broken the cipher for that particular period so they'll have a good idea of what's going on but at the same time they might not have and then they don't know what's going on so that that's a little bit of a coin toss as far as piecemeal elimination of the British advantage goes I don't think that would happen all that much the closest they got was when um Admiral Warrender's squadron was out there to support Beatty and the entire high seas fleet was in the area. But that was with the British having their intel advantage, but they, they didn't quite manage to clock that this event had occurred, because if they had, they certainly wouldn't have let Warrender go out there. Um, and without the signals intelligence, something like, say, Jutland becomes very much more difficult because 
uh, when you when you're talking about that kind of thing, Jutland happens the way it does because the British sail even before the Germans because they know that something's up. Um, whereas if you don't have a Jutland uh, scenario like that, it means the Germans will sail and kind of in a certain ways the first thing the British are going to know is when their Germans start hitting something which is going to delay their response but if they don't have particular signals intel I think it'll actually make the British a lot more cautious about sending out small squadrons so I think you're actually more likely to see there being less um, engagements and the British sailing in force a lot more often rather than anything else personally now that's not to say it couldn't have worked um it's i think but i think it would have had to have been a bit of an involved process rather than rather than sailing out and just hoping to catch them straight off what you would have had to do is keep doing small scale raids not have the high seas fleet out there in fact in, in a lot of the early raids maybe deliberately run before the enemy to demonstrate that you are completely alone that in turn might embolden the british to try and catch you in your sec in your sort of third fourth fifth attempt it's just a matter of that very fine balance of guessing when the british are going to go actually instead of chasing with just the battle cruisers we're going to send out battleships as well and then having the high seas fleet out for that particular engagement um, so it'd be a matter of very fine timing and not a small amount of lucky as, as well. And just one bit of channel admin for this week, which is to say that obviously we've got the uh, holidays coming up for most of us, except for uh, those who probably end up stuck working in retail. Uh, my sympathies to you. But um, since we, well, I at least will have a little bit more time on my hand as I take some annual leave from the day job. Um, I'm thinking of maybe doing a couple of extra live streams over the late December period. And uh, apart from the, just, just the general take questions from the audience, if there's anything you'd like to see me do in the background, maybe um, build some more ships in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts or randomly play games or, or talk about something like the photo collection and how it's being scanned or something, let me know in the comments below and we'll see what we can arrange. Alright, thank you very much for listening, and uh, see you in another video.